Ladies and gentlemen, I have been promoting this fantastic talk. This is a very important subject to my heart. So here on the Living Theosophy channel, and I believe it's also important to a lot of you as well, we have a very special guest tonight, and I'm so delighted. Kathy Gann is with us, and we recorded this earlier, but we will be live in the chat. So this is a premiere, so you can ask questions, but I will include all the links down below. Uh, we are running on different nights of the week because things are getting so busy here at Living Theosophy. Uh, so this is part of our Wednesday night series, and I can't wait to tell you about Kathy. Kathy has been studying theosophy for 27 years. She is a member of the Theosophical Society in America, and she has served on the board of directors of the Theosophical Order of Service in the USA, that's the TOS. And currently she serves on the board of directors of the Theosophical Society in America. She has also participated in leadership on her local Theosophical group in Denver, Colorado. And she has a particular interest in the practical application. We talk about this all the time on this channel, in the practical application of wisdom teachings. And she believes that a child who is exposed to these wisdom teachings, they have lifelong advantages, okay, of learning how to really think for themselves, to be kind and to be respectful to all forms of life. So tonight you're in for a very big treat. Parents, listen up. Um, I wanted to mention to Kathy really quick before we start that uh, when I started studying theosophy, I introduced it to my son really early, but not in a way that he even knew it was theosophical. Uh, Kathy, I just started telling him about these ways of living and uh, ways of life and how to react and navigate and take responsibility. So I, I know that you, your children as well, they were young when you started in theosophy as well. Is that right? Yes, uh, they were in elementary school, uh, maybe later elementary school when I first found it. And so, as you know, in childhood, um, many, many opportunities to come up, many teaching moments come up. And so yeah. it's just, once you have the perspective of theosophy under your belt as a parent, it's just so much easier to convey that worldview to the children and, you know, talk to them about how we look at things, how we think about things, how to think for yourself. And I think it really does make a difference. And, you know, my kids these days now are in their mid thirties, um, but they're really, they're both very able to look out into the world, look at situations going on and kind of make up their own minds about how they want to think and, and feel about things. So It gives me much hope for the future. And um, we often say that kids don't come with an instruction manual for us <laughs> parents, but how do we teach them about life and give them as guides uh, a way to navigate this world? Now, so theosophy is a brilliant way to bring this in. These are ancient divine uh, it's science, it's knowledge, it's quantum physics, it's astrophysics, it can be really, really big, and all the way down to the tiniest atom, it applies in every aspect of life. So tonight, Kathy is going to be spending some time with a text, which is really powerful, and um, I believe it's going to be a, a big thing tonight on tonight's show. It is called Because, for the children who ask why. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm Living Theosophy welcome to the one and only Kathy Gann on Theosophy for the Very Young tonight. Welcome, Miss Kathy. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very kind. So the, yeah, the book is wonderful. I have an older copy here. It's not really in, in print anymore, but I do have a 1968 edition that was printed in India. It was first written back in 1916. So it's set in that era, but it's really timeless, so it doesn't matter. It is uh, posted online, and hopefully you'll be able to include a link down below. Yep, the link will be down below, everybody, absolutely, for this book. Yeah, it's down below. so you, you can find the whole book online, which is wonderful these days. Um, the premise of the book is that it opens with the, the two children, Dorothy and Milton. We don't know exactly how old they are, but let's just say elementary school age, you know, not very old. And they're rather sad little campers because their dad is taking them on a train uh, to be with their Aunt Eleanor for the summer. Their mother has become very ill and dad can't take care of them and mom at the same time. So he's taking them to be with his sister, Aunt Eleanor, for the summer. And lucky for them, it turns out that Aunt Eleanor is just about one of the wisest theosophists on the planet. <laughs> She's extremely patient. She, she just doesn't mind answering questions all day long. And these two children are just particularly full of questions. So as the, as the summer unfolds, we see the children asking more and more questions about uh, circumstances that come up in their daily lives. And she sits down and just patiently answers. 
And it's, it's in those answers that we see how to present theosophy to children. So this is a book that was written a long time ago by, uh, it was published by the Theosophy Company, which is the publishing arm of the United Lodge of Theosophists. And the initial idea was let's, let's put out kind of like a resource manual for parents and teachers, but it was so popular that soon they discovered people were just handing the book to their children and said, here, read this, and then you'll <laughs> understand. <laughs> so it is really a wonderful resource for parents, teachers, grandparents, anybody who needs to explain uh, questions large and small to children. In, in Eleanor's approach, because she is a theosophist and the way she's talking to these very young, beautiful souls about what's going on, she probably has a very maybe a natural, because it's not, theosophy is not preachy. It isn't anything you, it's nothing too convoluted. It's a very easy way to live life. It's, it's a, a way of living. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about Eleanor's particular approach with these young ones? Sure, well, always very authentic, always very honest. She, she specifically says that she will never talk down to the children. Mm -hmm. She does, of course, use language and uh, examples and analogies that are suitable to their age so that they can relate to what she's saying and they can you know, catch on and understand what she's talking about. But other than using language and examples appropriate to their age, she really doesn't talk down to them at all. And she's always perfectly honest, always very authentic and genuine, you know, because children have very finely tuned non-sensometers, I'll call them, and they know if we're telling the truth or not, they can, they can sense it. And so in order to build this trust, you really have to speak authentically and they'll know whether we are or not. So today we're gonna to be addressing two very big questions that the children have brought to Aunt Eleanor. The first one is how to know right and wrong, how to know right from wrong. And the second one is what is meant by the word God? And this discussion, <laughs> these are big. Uh, the discussion came about as a result of something that happened one Sunday morning, Milton and Dorothy were outside in the yard and they were playing ball on a Sunday morning out in Aunt Eleanor's yard. And the neighbor boy, Chester came over and he said, you better not play ball on a Sunday. It's bad and God will punish you if you do. So this was new information to Milton and Dorothy and Milton asked some questions and he said, well, well, who is this God? Is God a policeman? And Chester said, oh no, 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 God's much bigger than that. He, he made the whole world and everything you see. And Milton said, well, who made God? And uh, Chester suddenly decided maybe he needed to run along and, <laughs> and go home. <laughs> he didn't really have a ready answer for that one. So Milton and Dorothy are a little perplexed. They're in the yard trying to figure this out and they decide they're just gonna have to go in and ask Aunt Eleanor whether it's really wrong to play ball on Sunday because they just can't fathom that it could be. And they also wanna know a little bit more about this God that Chester was telling them about. So of course, Aunt Eleanor says, well, now these are two very big questions and we need to separate these out. So we'll take one at a time. And first we're gonna talk about whether it's wrong to play ball on a Sunday. And she says, so first, before we can answer that question, we have to talk about what is right and what is wrong. She says, it would be very easy and true to say that if doing something harms nobody in the world, it doesn't do any harm to anybody, then it can't possibly be wrong. And it's also very easy and true to say that if doing something helps and serves everybody in the world, including yourself, then it's easy to say that that is right. So those are overly simplistic explanations. And she says, but it's not quite as simple as that because we each have to think for ourselves about what is right and what is wrong. And the reason for that is that what might be right for one person in their circumstance could be wrong for another person in their circumstance. And so to illustrate that, she talks about, she gives, uses the example of Chester and playing ball on a Sunday morning. She says, you see with Chester, he's raised by parents who believe that it is wrong to play ball on a Sunday and that God doesn't want you to, and that you'll get punished. So if Chester were to play ball on a Sunday, he knows that that would upset his parents. So because this would upset his parents, for Chester, it really would be wrong to play ball on a Sunday. But in the case of Dorothy and Milton, the grownups who take care of them don't mind if they play ball on a Sunday. And in fact, their grownups think it's a pretty good idea to be out in the yard getting fresh air and exercise. So for Dorothy and Milton, it would not be wrong to play ball on a Sunday. So this is something clearly she's focusing here, not on the day of the week, 
It has nothing to do with the day of the week. It has nothing to do with the act of playing ball itself. What it really has to do with is the effect that it has on other people. So Chester playing ball on a Sunday would harm his parents or upset them, so that's wrong. Dorothy and Milton playing ball on a Sunday bothers nobody, so that's okay. So at that point, a little light bulb goes on for Milton and he says, oh, well, so then God doesn't have the say of what's right and what's wrong. So this leads into the discussion of what God is. And Aunt Eleanor reminded Milton, now remember, each of us has to, remind, has to think for ourselves and figure out what is right and what is wrong. And so then she really gets into the crux of the matter. She says, you know, speaking of thinking for ourselves, that's really what we are. That's what each of us is, is a thinker and a perceiver. And this perceiver looks out on the whole world and it sees all these things in the world and yet it itself doesn't really change. And that thinker and perceiver is really the only God that we can ever know. And it is that thinker and perceiver that I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say it how she says it first, that it is the thinker and perceiver who rewards and punishes us. And I don't really care to use those words. I think they were popular at the time in yeah, 19th century. At the time, yes. But I would rather I would rather get to the heart of the matter, which is it's all about learning. Yeah. So it's the thinker and perceiver that decides what it is that we need to learn. Mm -hmm. And we cannot we cannot get away from that because we can't get away from ourselves. Mm -hmm. It is we ourselves, the thinker and perceiver in ourselves, who decides what's right and what's wrong and what we need to learn if we make a mistake. So of course, this is commonly known as karma. This is the, the teaching of law, uh, you know, cause and effect. And we always think of cause and effect as being on the physical plane. Mm -hmm. You know, we learn this in school, but karma of course is cause and effect on the moral planes as well as the physical. So Milton is really struggling with this a bit. And Eleanor has just explained that karma or cause and effect or the, the sense of right and wrong comes from deep within each of us. And he's, he's thinking over this thinker perceiver and he's not quite sure that he gets it. So he said, he asks if this thinker perceiver is always there. He wants to know if he had this thing when he was a baby and will he have it in a year, just the same as he has it now. And she says, it is always and always. But it's not exactly that you have it because it's true who you truly are. So we don't have the thinker and perceiver. We are the thinker and perceiver uh, deep inside. And then she asks him a series of questions to kind of draw out in him his own knowledge and get him to figure this out. She says, aren't you, Milton, just, this, just the same when you were a baby as when you were a baby? Aren't you the same now? I'm, you know, we, we can't get away from that sense of I'm me. I'm nobody else. I'm me. When we were children, we thought of ourselves as me. Now we think of ourselves as me. When we're in our 80s, we'll think of ourselves as me. And it, that doesn't change. That sense of I doesn't change. And so she says, you know, you'll, in, in a year, you'll know more than you do now, but you're still gonna be the Milton who knows the more. Mm -hmm. And you will still be the Milton who could know 10 times as much and still be Milton. So this is, you know, we see this in Eastern literature as it's often referred to as the eye-making faculty. It's that part of our consciousness that, that inescapably is me. And we each, we each uh, feel this within ourselves. And we are ourselves, no matter how our bodies change, no matter how our outer circumstances change, we just always feel ourselves to be this, this I am I, this consciousness, thinker and perceiver. So Milton is still struggling with this. He's just having a hard time because as children do, he's, he's identifying himself with his body. And of course, children are, are very focused on their bodies. And of course, their bodies change a lot. They're forever outgrowing their shoes and their clothing and so forth. So Aunt Eleanor is trying to get across to him and emphasizing that he is not his body. And in fact, when he grows up and has a grown up body, there won't be one single little particle in that grown-up body that is the same as what he has now. And yet he's going to still think, I'm me. So this must be something separate from the body. And, and Eleanor then brings in another word to describe this thinker and perceiver. She talks of it in terms of consciousness. 
And she says that it is this consciousness that is responsible for making all the changes in our bodies. And in fact, it's consciousness that causes all things to be done in the world. So then Milton gets an idea and he, he wants to know if it's this, this thinker perceiver, this consciousness that causes him to want a food so badly sometimes that his mouth waters. <laughs> and Anne Elsner says, yes, it is. <laughs> And it, she says, it's really quite a wonderful story about how our body takes in food. We take in food into our body. And then there are all these little thinkers and perceivers within our body that makes that food, uh, converts it into a form that we can use as energy and, and causes it to be useful. So we, we have several names for all these different parts in the bodies. We call them cells, membranes, tissues, organs, bones. But she says they're really thinkers in their own way. Now, she doesn't mean that they are thinkers in the same way that a human being thinks, but an intelligence at their own level. They know what to do. Our bodies know what to do with the food when they get it, and they convert it in just the way it needs to be converted. And so all these little thinkers within our bodies are thinking at their own levels. And now at this point, another light bulb comes on for Milton, and he says, oh, Auntie, do you mean that everything is a thinker? <laughs> And she says, everything dear in the wide, wide world. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> she says, only there are different kinds of thinking. For example, the stone can't think as much as the plant. Mm -hmm. The plant can't think as much as the animal. And the animal can't think as much as a human being or can't have as complex a thought. Mm -hmm. And so this leads into a discussion of all the different forms of life on earth. And Anne Eleanor really kind of wraps it up here and sums it up. And I love what she says next. She said, there is no better word for God than life. Oh. Life with a capital L. And I love that. She yeah. talks about how we live in a universe of life. And it has many grades, just like Milton and Dorothy's school has grades. Mm -hmm. So she said, we could, we could say that maybe, maybe we call the mineral kingdom, you know, rocks and such. Mm -hmm. Maybe we call that the first grade. So if we call the mineral kingdom the first grade, even so, there would be many forms of life that aren't even ready for that yet. And then suppose we call the human kingdom the last grade in the school. Even so, there are many beings who have gone beyond that. Mm -hmm. And so she's laying out you know, this idea of working through the different grades and learning different lessons in the grades, but she's presenting life as a continuum. And then she talks about the different levels of functioning that life at these different forms have. And she says that, you know, for example, stones can't move on their own. You can pick up a rock and you can throw it, mm -hmm. but a stone couldn't move on its own, even if, it, even if it could think at that level and decide that it wanted to, which it doesn't, but it, it can't move. <laughs> yeah. and, and even a plant, and, and there have been experiments that have shown that plants do have some form of cognition and response. But even a plant has to stay right where it's rooted. It can't just move around. But life at the animal level can move around. Um, it's just, I mean, their bodies can move around. And the way she explains it is the difference between an animal and a human is that although their bodies can move around just like we can move around, their minds can't move around quite like ours do. Mm. And so Milton calls this the mind emotion. And there's the body motion and the mind motion. And, and Anne Eleanor says, you know, for example, an animal can't really plan what it wants to do next month. Yeah. So it can't think in that way. And she often has brought up within this discussion, she will bring up the idea of self-consciousness. And the way she says it to Milton is an animal can think, but it doesn't know that it's thinking. It doesn't know that it's an animal and it doesn't know that it's thinking. You know that you're a boy and you know that you're thinking. And so that's one of the differences between animals and, and humans. And then finally, Milton just wraps it all up and he says, oh, so it's the mind motion that makes us different from animals. And, and then the God in us is just the same as the God in animals, only in us, it knows it knows, right? Mm -hmm. And Anne Eleanor says, yes, that is the whole story of life. That is it in a nutshell. And she says, it's all, all about the different life forms, always growing, always becoming something bigger and better, always turning into something wiser. And you know, one of the things I love best about Aunt Eleanor is that she always knows when it's time to wrap up a discussion so that she's not filling their heads with too much. She doesn't, doesn't wanna make their heads explode. <laughs> and so at that point, she figures Milton has had enough for one day and she sends him out to play. 
So that might be a very good uh, wrapping up place for us as oh, well. We have tackled yeah. some really big questions. Kathy Gann, that was so beautiful. And Eleanor, go and Eleanor. It was so gentle and it was self-reflective and it was it was understandable. This is absolutely sacred and important. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was just, yes, again, the, the link is in the bio down below or the description down below. Uh, the name of the book is called Because for the Children Who Ask Why. And these are young children and it's a way to present these ancient principles to them so they can understand and imagine those of you who are here who are theosophists or who understand theosophy or if you're brand new this is a great way to be introduced you don't even have to be a kid to hear this and, and understand you can be any age and go oh okay I kind of get it that makes sense but mm -hmm. Aunt Eleanor we all need an Aunt Eleanor we oh, absolutely do. <laughs> and she, she covered every it was I started to get like my my heart was started to soar as you're explaining these so beautifully um, written in 1916, but they've taken a very convoluted uh, bunch of texts, uh, which can be quite complex and like metaphysical poems. These are really um, ancient and they've made them into something that can be applied for the very, very young. And these are the, the humans of the future. And that's why I invited Kathy on here is to be able to introduce us um, to a, a way for us to introduce these uh, to those that we love. And these teachings are not exclusive. They belong to everybody and solely to none. Uh, they're a way to navigate through life uh, in every possible way, like these two young ones playing ball on a Sunday morning, understanding their responsibility, their role, other people's feelings, to respect those feelings. This is brilliant. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I, I don't wanna gush too much, but I am terribly excited because I, as I was saying before we started, going live, how important this is, the time is right now with the internet the way that it is for us to get these teachings out into the world, all over the world. Um, that's what we're doing here. So um, Kathy, is there anything that I didn't, uh, that we didn't cover that you'd like to um, say in this lesson? What is God, which is a very, very big deal, and playing ball on a Sunday? I mean, those, those are yeah, big, big <laughs> subjects. And uh, and Eleanor, I just loved her. Um, are there more lessons in the book then? Many, many more lessons Yay. in the book. This is just chapter one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> many, yeah. many more. And unfortunately in chapter five, and Eleanor is tasked with the, the subject of death and having to explain death to the children. So that's another big one. Um, something that the, the book I think can help with a whole lot if someone in the family passes away mm. and you're faced with have, having to tell children and explain death to children. Yes. Um, and Eleanor has much to say about that as well. Oh, that sounds fantastic. I'd love to have Very you back good. for more. If you're interested, no obligation. Uh, but I would I'd love, love it. it. <laughs> oh, you would love it. That's great. I would love it. <laughs> oh, I would love it too. Thank you so, so much. We're going to try to keep these short. I know I've always said that in the past and we usually go long, but Kathy uh, just hit it again out of the park with all of this fantastic information, very palatable, uh, applicable, uh, relatable. And this was written in 1916. So we're bringing it into 2021 uh, for the children of today um, who will be the humans that are leading the world tomorrow. Um, so your children have benefited from your journey and Alex hopefully has benefited a little bit from mine. They're their own people though, and they're their own um, uh, incarnations. They don't belong to us. They're only here with us for a while, um, but to give them these lessons early, just imagine that's the best thing you can do for your children is to give them that freedom to think for themselves and the self-responsibility. And you even covered karma in there, which is fantastic. So thank you, Kathy Gann. Again, Kathy out of Denver, Colorado, coming in with us and she'll be back because she said she would. So I'm excited. About I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I don't want to lose you. I'd love to have you. No, I, I would love to. I can't wait. Oh, bless you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Welcome to the end of the video. Here we are backstage at Living Theosophy 2.0. So if you like the video, please like, subscribe, hit the bell icon so you can be notified when Living Theosophy has a brand new video. And there's lots of things happening here at Living Theosophy. And uh, I, for a long time, didn't want to ask if you would like and subscribe because I was trying to be humble. But Without the algorithm, these teachings can't get out to where they need to be. So I'm going to say, please like and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you back here. I love you.